Hey, hey everyone. Back again. Today we're going to talk about Soren Kierkegaard's The Concept of Anxiety. Now, I want to say that I'm going to cover this text, and then when I'm done with this, so after two weeks, I'm going to move on to his uh, Sickness Unto Death. And the reason that I'm doing that is because it's really necessary to grapple with both of these texts to understand what Kierkegaard is on about. Now, before jumping into it, if you want to help me out. Uh, you can like, share, subscribe. If you're new here, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts in an accessible way uh, to help you along your philosophical journey. Um, if So if you haven't already, like, share, subscribe. And if you're listening to this on YouTube or if you found me on YouTube, you can find me pretty much anywhere you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads, which is obviously better. If you're listening to this in podcast form, sometimes I release videos that you might like as well. Uh, if you want to follow me anywhere other than on here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy to see mostly pictures of my cats, that is. If you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but feel don't 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 feel obliged, of course. And that is pretty well it. Now, to jump into it here, uh, that is into Kierkegaard, I found myself really conflicted. Not, not with the text, but with the way that Kierkegaard is talked about among other people online. And that is because I was reading this, and it was the first time I was really digging into Kierkegaard, and it was conflicting with everything I'd already known about him, mostly knowledge I'd accrued from people I know and from uh, videos I'd seen. And so I was like, what is going on? And I went back and checked out some videos about him online and, and about these texts, and they really mischaracterize it, it to a, a, a concerning degree. And this is often the case, but um, like with this text, it was just especially troublesome. And I want to just briefly characterize how I understood Kierkegaard and how I think uh, he is being misunderstood. And that is because, or that is in the way that he is kind of figured as a, a prominent figure within existentialism. Specifically, what people focus on in Kierkegaard is the way that he kind of formulates uh, a degree of responsibility for oneself. So we read Kierkegaard, we're taught about Kierkegaard in order to better understand ourselves. That is, we're supposed to take from Kierkegaard a roadmap to make ourselves better for ourselves, which is in part correct. But what is often excluded is the discussion of Christianity and then that cannot be ignored. In, in fact, if you <laughs> confront any text or any kind of uh, summary of this text or Kierkegaard's work that doesn't talk about Christianity, then be very skeptical about what they're telling you. And it and I, I really wouldn't be saying that because like, honestly, I with some texts, if there's like vague little Christian allusions or anything like that, I'll just ignore it. But with this, it you have to talk about it. Anyways, I don't want to waste any more of your time with my rambling. Let's jump into it here with the introduction, which is a great place to start. So to begin, the concept of anxiety, which has a pretty long uh, subtitle, a simple psychologically orienting deliberation on the dogmatic use of hereditary sin, which I'll come to explain what all of that means as we go on here. Uh, but to start out this book, he first takes aim at Hegel. And if anyone wants some more knowledge about Hegel, I've done a few videos on him, uh, specifically the Phenomenology of Spirit, which you can go check out if you'd like. But Kierkegaard here is very dissatisfied with what Hegel gives us in his philosophy, in his system. Now, I've heard this to mean that Kierkegaard has a, has a general disdain for German, uh, German idealism when I, I don't read that all so much. Like Kierkegaard was taking courses uh, from Schelling and was indebted to Fichte, but he really didn't, he, he really has, has some trouble here with Hegel. And in some ways, he really harkens back to Kant and draws upon some Kantian influence. But I'm not going to go into all those details because it's it will take us on a really long uh, tangent. But in any case, he starts this book to criticize Hegel. So in Hegel's work, the negative, what Hegel frames as the negative, is that which allows movement of anything under consideration. 
So we use the negative in terms of the lord and bondsman interaction to describe the way that the bondsman, the person who is in servitude, actually has a certain potential afforded to them that is not afforded to the lord, in that by occupying this negative position against which um, the lord, you know, can't uh, or doesn't want to like measure themselves, the lord is caught in a kind of stagnation, whereas occupying a certain negative position, this bondsman is able to push themselves further and it allows for a kind of movement. And that's just a very basic way of putting it. Uh, but in any case, that's, that's what we have here. So Kierkegaard thinks this is logically inconsistent because it makes movement, that is change, a necessary component of anything, thereby stripping all possible, all possible identity. So in Hegel, no like thing per se has a, has a kind of essence rather, you know, we always have these dialogue dialectical conflicts that brush up against things that motivate them to move dialectically in such a way that it really problematizes any easy uh, identification of a given thing. Precisely, or this comes down to Hegel's formula uh, to negate the negation, and that is to acknowledge that between things we don't acknowledge their, um, their consistencies, but rather we see among their incon inconsistencies, or sorry, their differences, a common difference, which doesn't give us any kind of clear uh, identifiable categories. Instead, we are only developing a knowledge about something precisely by the fact that all things are different to some extent. So the problem is a kind of, um, for, is, is amplified, that is, for Kierkegaard, when we recall how in logic, the, the logic by uh, Hegel, Hegel positions actuality as the final stage. So actuality being uh, kind of coming into being, being realized. Kierkegaard wants actuality to instead pre be presupposed, not something that comes at the end, but is actually something that comes at the beginning. And the reason for that is that if you don't have some ground upon which, that is a steady ground upon which to begin your philosophical speculations, all you are going to do is develop uh, empty concepts, imaginative constructions that are not grounded upon anything and that are therefore like frivolous and not not real. So Kierkegaard wants actuality to be presupposed and to ground the entire enterprise of being and anything kind of affiliated with it instead of it being at the end. Now what is more, what he tries to do or what he does actually quite quite effectively is demonstrate that there is a kind of original point. Uh, and I want to put a pin in that language because we're going to problematize this idea of there being a kind of first point. But let's just say for now, there's an original point of any given, in this case, let's say a human. And that original point is the human's existence within what is called hereditary sin. That is, Kierkegaard wishes to demonstrate that all humans have in common their mutual stake within hereditary sin. Now, hereditary sin comes from the Bible. Uh, obviously, comes from the Old Testament when Adam, and for those that may not be familiar, uh, the Bible begins with what the chapter or the part called Genesis, in which God creates uh, earth and, and, hum and humans, creating Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve well, first there's Adam, I should say. And when Adam is created, Adam has no conception of good and evil. And along comes a snake, and, and Eve is there by now. Along comes a snake, and the snake says, hey, uh, take a bite of this apple that is from the tree of knowledge, and you will develop the understanding of what is good and evil. So in taking this apple and biting into it, Adam is given the knowledge of what is good and what is evil. And that is considered to be the first sin. However, Kierkegaard quite intelligently says the only way that that was possible, that is the only way that Adam was able to uh, kind of go against God's wishes not to eat from the tree of knowledge was if he already had within him some knowledge of what was good and what was bad. That is, Adam had a moment in which he was like, hmm, I'm not totally satisfied with my situation. I'm going to eat from this tree to expand my horizons. So in that way, 
Kierkegaard wants to demonstrate that there is an original first sin, that is the eating of the apple, but that humans, even Adam in this case, was actually born into sin. And as he will come to show, not so much in this text, but in the following one, which doesn't follow it chronologically, but that I'm going to talk about, um, or that there are quite a few texts in between, but in any case, I'm going to talk about sickness unto death in a few weeks. In that text, Kierkegaard goes into a much longer discussion about um, what it means for God in terms of God being enmeshed within uh, sin itself. So all that to say that humans have this kind of uh, presupposed stake within hereditary sin all the way back to Adam. And we're going to expand on this in a little bit. I just want to kind of um, put it out there for us. So acknowledging that we all have this kind of mutual stake within sin, what Kierkegaard wants to do is employ a science to understand it because it's this kind of consistent attribute among us. And in order to do that, he, he hones in into what at the time he was calling psychology. So that hence the, you know, the subtitle being concerned with uh, anxiety, which is a psychological disposition, um, and with the fact that he says it's a psychological investigation, essentially. But by psychology, what he is doing um, is, is trying to show what is making the brain tick to some extent and how this isn't a material uh, instance. That is, we aren't just pointing to parts of the brain that determines how people are acting or like certain, uh, certain uh, social attributes or social characteristics that are determined by X, Y, and Z factors. Instead, he is showing through this psychological uh, investigation what all humans have in common that is this stake in hereditary sin and how that motivates a degree of anxiety within us now he wants to begin with this science that is he wants to begin with the psychology in order to move to eventually dogmatic so he's going to show through this um, i guess this reflection upon a feeling of anxiety that people have to demonstrate that there is this kind of common Nality in terms of hereditary sin and then from there he goes and especially into the in the next text sickness unto death to demonstrate how this is a religious orientation how this relates specifically with god and more specifically with the christian god not even uh, the god of judaism but the the christian god is really what he's concerned with so psychology for him can explain the presence of sin but only dogmatics can actually explain the presence of hereditary sin. That is, we can explain through psychology that people do bad things. But the fact that we are always born into hereditary sin, we are born into sin, can only come about through an acknowledgement of dogmatics, through an acknowledgement of God and, and the Bible. So if any of you, any of you, any of you uh, kind of has the sense now that Kierkegaard is just... A religious person and he's just trying to push his religious uh kind of lens onto the world i would say 100 percent you are true you are right uh kierkegaard is very upfront about the fact that he is uh in favor of a christian form of being and it makes you wonder if we didn't have the texts that we ascribe to christianity whether or not kierkegaard's philosophy would really stick or if it is just a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, a kind of tautology in that he says that uh, we need, you know, to live out Christian doctrine because it is the most true. And that is because uh, we know truth to be Christian. Like, it's just a, it's, yeah. In any case, that makes me, troubles me a little bit, but it, it's what we have. So we know what psych is, that is psychology. But what is, what is anxiety? What is the anxiety that... Kierkegaard is describing here and interested in. Well, for this, at least a definition that I liked was actually supplied by the uh, the editors of this, the copy that I have, in which they write, or I should say, I think it's uh, Rader Tomt and Albert B. Anderson, but in any case, they write, anxiety is the self-awareness of the finite self as finite. Like finitude, anxiety is ontological. It cannot be derived from anything. Anxiety differs from fear in that the object of anxiety is nothingness, and nothingness is not an object, whereas fear relates itself to an object. So the thing that we feel anxiety over, and I really think you can think of anxiety here as the 
just kind of common understanding of anxiety uh, that any of us feel. Notably, it is uh, a, a sense of kind of um, concern over the future. And this has a kind of, this dovetails with an idea of uh, possibility. That is the anxiety we feel over possibility, being confronted with too many possibilities. And we confront that, yet we acknowledge that us as, as humans are finite. That is, we could never possibly engage with all of these possibilities. And so we are confronted with our finiteness, which is, in the words supplied here, a kind of nothingness. That is, it. It is just what we are, yet we can't seem to come to terms with it. And it's something that always kind of scratches at us, kind of the back of our head, reminding us over and over and over again that we are, to some extent, inadequate. We do not have the potential to be all we want to be. And that leads to a kind of anxious feeling. Now, the presence of anxiety reveals something interesting in that if we didn't feel it at all, if we didn't feel a sense of anxiety, which is never like pleasant, no one, no one experiences anxiety as something that is good. But the fact that we experience it as something unpleasant reveals to us that it is not an ontological condition, which might seem strange given what I just read, because it both is and isn't an ontological condition. That is, we are born into it and we are geared towards, uh, uh, geared towards anxiety. But it reveals to us that there is maybe a, a glimmer, a, a kind of little sliver of possibility to escape this anxiety. And spoiler alert, what it comes down to for him is faith, and that is faith in God. And that puts us here into chapter one, kind of to start, it off, start us out here. Anxiety is the presupposition of hereditary sin. That is the title of the chapter, how anxiety reveals to us that there is a thing called hereditary sin, sin that we are born into that comes from before us. So when pondering hereditary sin, uh, where do we attribute its origin? And I've kind of already stumbled through this talking about Adam, but we're going to get into it a little bit more here. So it would be wrong for Kierkegaard to attribute it to Adam's first sin, because that would mean that somehow Adam was different from the rest of humanity that followed him. So if we said that hereditary sin begins with Adam, that is with Adam taking the tree, uh, the apple from the tree, then that would reveal that before that moment, before Adam had taken the apple from the tree, he was ostensibly pure, which would mean that at that moment, or in all those moments before he took from the tree, he was separate from humanity, because Kierkegaard believes here that to be human is to be within hereditary sin. And if that was the case, that is, if Adam was truly outside of humanity, he could not have possibly been a kind of progenitor or uh, uh, our great, 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 great to infinity uh, grandfather, essentially, in if we uh, kind of follow the Christian doctrine or the biblical doctrine, I should say, at least. And so he would exist outside of history, which would have made him conducting any kind of sin, this first sin an impossibility. That is, uh, and um, to talk about it in kind of Kantian terms here, what that would have meant is that we would have had an effect, uh, uh, let's say a consequence, that is him taking the apple from the tree, without a cause, because it would have just come from nowhere. It would have just come from from nothing, essentially. That So in order to circumvent this problem, that is the problem that Adam is both sinful before committing the first sin is for us to kind of have what's called a qualitative leap, which is some in some other places discussed as a leap of faith in order for us to believe that Adam is both in his conception when he is first made by God, born into sin, and so has the capacity to sin, but only conducts the first sin uh, within that sin when he takes from the apple. So he is first, he is both the original point that precedes taking the apple, and he is the first conductor of a specific sin that is taking the apple. Now, this dovetails with a, a broader idea that Kierkegaard wants to put forth, and that is that every single human on earth belongs both to themselves and to the human species, just like Adam. To say otherwise 
is to leave open the possibility that you can escape hereditary sin as though you, you yourself could be a god when in fact you cannot. We are all born into hereditary sin as per uh, biblical doctrine. So we should consider the history of sin as a circle, not a line. That is, it folds back in on itself. It's not as though there's a first point. The point is this kind of perfect circular uh, being or this circular kind of uh, demonstration of time in which the beginning point is could be any point on this line. That is, any sin is essentially the same as the first sin in that we are all within sin at, at all times. Now, I've called this the qualitative leap or the leap of faith, but leap of faith doesn't appear anywhere in this text. It's just a kind of nice way to think about it uh, in that it works really well within kind of uh, Kierkegaard's obsession with, with faith and with what he's essentially doing here. But this is also the way that Kierkegaard frames the dialectic for him. That is, the dialectic for him is the maintenance of a contradiction that is without them being, uh, it's a contradiction without them having to contradict one another per se, or without one having to overcome the other. And the one that we are presented with here is that we are, we can conduct a first sin or a first sin can be conducted, but it, that first sin only happens within sinfulness already existing, which is a contradiction. It feels kind of, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. Yet we can accept it only if we take this qualitative leap or this leap of faith. So like Adam, all humans are born innocent. That is, as babies, children, we are innocent. And we can conduct our first sins in, in our lives. We can do our commit our first sins. But that doesn't mean that even within our innocence, we weren't born into sin. That is, we weren't sinful because we, we were. Now, before this moment, before we have knowledge of our common stake with sin after having conducted our first sin and he will come to say that being anxious is itself the demonstration of sin he says that we are ignorant before that moment before the, our first sin we are ignorant in that we do not have knowledge of um what is good and evil what is what is uh, sinfulness and and by contrast faith we have essentially, we have nothing in his words against which to strive. And this, in a sense, pr produces a kind of anxiety within us in that it makes us stagnant. We don't have a possibility, which is in itself a demonstration for Kierkegaard of a kind of sinfulness. And so when we are in this state, when we are in a state of refusing to uh, develop, to strive for anything, of not having that capacity, what we are lacking in that moment is what Kierkegaard here calls spirit. Now, I've seen a lot of things about people trying to explain what spirit is, and it's not its not about, like, having school spirit, and it's not about having, like, a kind of gusto. Spirit is a lot more uh, complicated than that, even though y you can take that as a starting point. Instead, how we have to think about spirit is, is for Kierkegaard... A kind of glue that holds together our physical bodies and our psychical minds that is our body and mind now that's how he just kind of introduces it and to really this annoys me in that he throughout the course of the book and throughout the next book he kind of builds upon it a little bit he builds upon this idea of spirit to give us a more uh kind of nuanced understanding of it but in order to grasp it entirely, I want to lay out some other important premises about it that only come out later in the text. But I think it'll be helpful if we kind of set them out in advance here first before moving on. So spirit is the glue, as I said, that holds body and mind together. Well, what does that mean? We can also think about that in another way. We can think about the body as being finite and the mind as having some kind of connection to the infinite. Now, he doesn't say that in, in quite those terms, and the reason I want to add a little asterisk here is to say that I'm just drawing this parallel in order for the sake of simplicity. Whereas for him, he doesn't connect the body to uh, the finite and the mind to the infinite. Instead, he, he just kind of considers those things uh, on their own. So if we were to imagine, just for the sake of argument, that the body has a connection to 
the finite, which is like connection to the earth, to material, to uh, our friends and family, the thing that people sees, where our, whereas our mind is connected to eternity, to the infinite, then what is happening here is that spirit is that connecting moment, that glue that bridges the human between both the finite and the infinite. So this can also be characterized in another way as the uh, kind of contrast between necessity and possibility, where the body can be thought in terms of necessity, whereas possibility is in accordance with the infinite. That is when we are confronted with endless possibility, we you know, uh, see a way out of ourselves. But if we were to subscribe to either of those things in their entirety, that is if we were to shed necessity in favor of possibility, we couldn't do it because that would mean that we would have no base from which to engage in possibility. Or if we fully issued, got rid of all possibility in favor of necessity, in favor of like our body, our just, um, material surroundings, we would foreclose the possibility of our own growth. And as well, we would then cease to be human. So there is a kind of perfect balance between these two that we are always uh, engaged in. And the reason that we have this balance is through spirit being that kind of connecting uh, component, that glue that holds them together in, in that kind of steady equilibrium which connects to this idea of the qualitative leap as well, in that at any given time, we are both possibility and we are both necessity as well. We are both uh, finity, we are both finitude and infinity. We are both, as he will come to say later, temporal and eternal. We are both body and mind. We are all these things. And the reason that that is the case is because they are held in a steady dialectical equilibrium where one doesn't overtake the other. Now, I want to add a little bit to this as well, and this is from Sickness Unto Death, the next book we're going to talk about in a few weeks. So he says that the spirit is self. So we are in ourselves this kind of liminal space between eternity and the temporal, between infinity and finitude, where he goes on to say that self is relation. So we are this relation between the infinity and the finite. We are this middle ground that relates itself to itself or is the relations relating itself to itself in the relation? So what the hell does that mean? What I think is important to take away from this, because it's, it's incredibly uh, difficult to wrap one's head around. When we are discussing a self, we are discussing that liminal space, the connection of three different things, that is body, mind, and spirit, or uh, eternity, uh, temporality, and spirit, or any of the other ones I introduced. And in that, we are the relationship between two different poles, that is uh, eternity and t temporality, for example. We are the relationship that acknowledges, acknowledges itself, not as either one of those, but as the relationship itself. So we are the relation that relates itself to itself. We acknowledge this status as relation and embrace it. And that is really what, what spirit is. And he will come to say in the next book that as we grow in spirit, so too do we grow in our knowledge of God, because God is the eternal. God is what gives us the possibility for this connective, uh, being this connective tissue between the eternal and the temporal. And God is what gives us this temporality in the first place. Now, if this is all very overwhelming at this point, I'd like to say that I think it'll get easier, but the reason that it is so difficult is because this is by no means an easy text and Kierkegaard is not an easy thinker. So if you've only been, been introduced to Kierkegaard as a thinker of existentialism and about how like, oh, we have to know yourself for the sake of like living a good life, then that it's sure that would have been easy, but you've been led astray. You've been seriously duped as to what Kierkegaard is on about. So after having set this all up, spirit is the condition for freedom because spirit has the connection to or gives us our temporal bodies that we often associate with our own like thinking uh, being per se, that is our wanting various things. The reason that we have possibility and freedom is because we have a, that spirit connecting us to that 
uh, kind of component of the universe to possibility so that we aren't just necessity, we aren't just flesh and bone. And here we enter a kind of new form of anxiety. That is the anxiety that we are presented with when we acknowledge that we have this connection to all possibility. So at any given moment, you can do any number of things. But we have anxiety because we don't know which one of those things are right. Now, it's not simply about just doing what is right for you here. Kierkegaard is very clear that the task is about recognizing what is good in the eyes of God, not just for yourself. It's not just about know yourself, even though uh, Kierkegaard will take up that Socratic sentiment, you know, know, know thyself or know yourself. He will take that up as being like a starting point, but then it is about acknowledging that the very possibilities that we are given are only bestowed upon us by God, not not, our, not ourselves. We aren't just dropped into a world uh, with absolutely no connection to anything and then are given a kind of full reign as though we were in some kind of video game. Uh, it's That's not the case at all, even though in the comments, uh, video games are very, man, they're very regulated, very, very coded and structured. I know that. I know that. But the point is that we have a kind of indebtedness to this creator, and Kierkegaard is very clear about that. But like how I said earlier that anxiety isn't, it, it is both original within us, it derives from within us, and it doesn't seem to because it's also like, feels like unnatural, because it's not pleasant. Whereas if it was something we never noticed, then it would just be part of us. But the reason that we feel it, and the reason that it, it kind of has an impact on us is because there must be, as I said, the sliver of possibility of moving beyond it. And as, I, as I've already said, to give us this opportunity for faith. And that is in reconciling body, mind, and spirit under or being in accordance with God. And that puts us here into chapter two. Anxiety is explaining hereditary sin progressively. So with sinfulness, history is opened. And so is anxiety and hereditary sin. So because sinful... The reason that sinfulness opens up history is because we all have a connection with it, with hereditary sin. So it is itself a kind of connecting glue to all humanity, which allows us to pull from a common uh, his history, which gives us this kind of sense of connection. So it should be stressed in that case that anxiety precedes sin to some degree because anxiety is present in innocence, as I already said earlier, with uh, its connection to ignorance. Uh, as a kind of a longing for, uh, or a kind of a longing for possibility that it doesn't yet have because it's ignorant. But in any case, this anxiety continues on. It exists in both. It exists both before original sin and after it. That is each individual sin uh, before and after um, Adam. And he he adds that, and he just kind of stresses that. It shouldn't be viewed as though Adam's sin was any more violent, was any more sinful than any sin that followed him, or that the other way around, that any sin that comes after him is therefore worse than anyone before it. They are all the same in degree, essentially, in that they all are within a general kind of aura of sinfulness that we all belong to. Now, maybe I should characterize that a little bit differently in that Kierkegaard says that all sins are, are pretty much the same following Adam, but there is a, a general degree or an augmentation, a kind of increase in the severity or in the intensity of them, depending on obviously which sin is being conducted, where murdering someone is worse than stealing, for example. And because we are existing in this kind of history of sin, the further we move along in this history, so too do the, does the kind of intensity of that sin increase. Now, what this means then is that anxiety will be reflective in a subsequent individual or will be uh, more intense in a subsequent individual than in Adam because the quantitative accumulation left behind by the race, the human race, now makes itself felt in that individual where they are bringing with them the entire burden of their previous history of human history into that uh, new sin they conducted or committed. Now to combat this, to combat sin, which he develops much more in the next book, he says that salvation has to be posited. That is a connection to God. That is the possibility for forgiveness, which we'll get into a lot more later on. But anyways, he just kind of drops that in here because it's important still to maintain that there is the possibility to move beyond sin, to move beyond anxiety or else 
they wouldn't feel like negative things unless they were uh, not necessarily part of us yet are part of us, which is a very obviously a very co complicated idea, and we have to just accept it with the qualitative leap. Now, to be a little bit more specific, we have to acknowledge that anxiety can be then split into two different forms. There's either the individual anxiety that we feel uh, in the individual sins we conduct or confronted with our individual possibilities, and then there's objective anxiety that is universal, that is the uh, kind of entire anxiety of the human of human history experienced in every individual when they are born, the hereditary anxiety, I will say, or hereditary sin they are born into, that they uh, are a part of no matter what. And then on top of that, they have their own subjective anxiety. So in the transition from innocence to sinfulness, or from innocence to guilt, or ignorance to knowledge, ignorance to guilt, as, a, as I've already kind of suggested this move goes, you know, from a child being innocent to, to a sinful uh, person, what we have is a mutation of anxiety. Where previously, as I've already mentioned, anxiety at, within innocence is anxiety about nothing, right? Having no possibility because you don't have the knowledge of possibility. Whereas within guilt, that is within uh, a sinful person, an adult, pretty much, the kind of guilt we experience and the anxiety we experience can is kind of developed to be connected to more and more of something, not just to nothing, because we now have knowledge about possibility. So we then begin to feel anxious about a, perhaps a specific thing or the entire uh, magnitude, the entire constellation of all possibilities. Now, he stresses as well, because of course he had to talk about gender, that across genders, if we're dealing with the... Um, a binary form of, of gender, what we have is for him that women experience anxiety to a greater degree than men. And this is because for him, he speculates, they have more freedom. And he, there's the example of the fact that Eve was the one that seduces Adam to eat the apple from the garden, from the tree of knowledge. So Eve had almost more autonomy in that moment than Adam did. And for that reason, he goes on to say that women are essentially corresponding to this kind of feminine idea about what um, freedom is are also more connected to the body and more sensuous in that they are uh, more kind of grounded in uh, beauty and and the the possibilities that that affords but we don't that it's not totally necessary to take him too seriously on this but in any case this is what he gives us so with sin so too does emerge, besides like anxiety, sexual difference. So the difference between uh, the sexes in this case emerges with sin, and we get this from the Bible too, when after uh, Adam eats the apple and they are, Adam and Eve are cast out from the Garden of Eden, suddenly they become, they, they know about their, or when they, just after he eats the apple, suddenly they are aware of their nakedness, and they can see that they are different. They are different uh, than one another. And before that, they wouldn't have had any need to procreate. They wouldn't have had any need to have sex, essentially, because they weren't geared uh, in the kind of human way that we understand procreation now. They just had God making things where Eve was created from Adam. You didn't need to have copulation. So he adds that, or I should say, recall how spirit is the kind of connecting glue between the physical and the psychical, between the mind and, and body. It can also be understood as a, or it is also a component of a kind of the glue between the sexes here and between the kind of uh, the possibility for eroticism being sex itself and how that is unnatural to in, in God's eyes because it is the product of having taken from the uh, tree of knowledge and therefore only then being aware of one's nakedness and the possibility for sex and sexual difference. So it's any time that that happens, any time sex is conducted, it is happening in impurity. It is not, uh, it can never be pure because it is a sign of that first original sin. But yet, there was still, and acknowledged by God, the fact that there was a difference between Adam and Eve in the biblical tradition in Genesis because he made Eve as a different creature from Adam. So that gives us the idea that sexual difference is itself presupposed before the first actual separation of the two, the acknowledgement of the separation of the two by humanity when they eat from the garden, they eat from the tree of knowledge. Now, given all this, 
it would be too easy for us to say that Kierkegaard doesn't like anxiety or that he all he's trying to do is move beyond anxiety. When in fact, he writes that anxiety is an expression of the perfection of human nature and it essentially grows the further collective humanity moves away from Adam. So there is a kind of telos here. We, we are developing as a species in our growing acknowledgement and understanding of anxiety, which means that we are growing in our knowledge of our collective state uh, within sinfulness and within hereditary sin, which only brings us closer to God in acknowledging this, this kind of common pact that we have between us. So the concern that Kierkegaard has is not necessarily that someone experiences sin or anxiety, I should say, but he's more concerned with people that are anxious, uh, who aren't anxious, I should say, about being regarded as guilty or as sinful to themselves, but when they are instead only concerned about it because of others. They, you know, they just want to look good for others. And in the next book, he discusses a little bit more about his disdain for most branches of the kind of little branches of Christianity and the the many pastors that are out there and stuff and how most of them don't actually understand gospel. They don't under, actually understand God's message. And so he's concerned primarily with people who are led astray by their own misconceptions about God and the Bible and sin that then he is about a person acknowledging their own sin and embracing it. So the kind of last thing he says in this chapter that I think is important to mention is that as hum this human history progressive in this kind of teleological way and our acknowledgement about sin progresses, so too does our knowledge about uh, our senses, senses and our kind of sensate um, faculties or what he just calls our sensuousness. And with this, there is much more temptation to just kind of embrace the sensuous instead of embracing the more rigid and fruitful things of our mind and spirit. So he says to kind of combat that, that in order for us to effectively move beyond anxiety would demand us to give our sensuousness over to spirit and to acknowledge its place within spirit. And yeah, That'll conclude up this half here. That is, I covered about the first half of the text, and then next week I'll, I'll finish it off. But yeah, if you listen this far, I hope that I've been helpful for any of you interested in Kierkegaard. Or if, you know, you think I mischaracterized him or there's stuff I should add, I would love to hear about it. Um, you know, leave a comment, like, share, subscribe if you like what I did here. And yeah, you, you tell your friends they might like this. Then again, they might not. I've heard I have a soothing voice. I might be able to help you or your friends sleep at night if you want me around when, when you're asleep, which is a creepy way to put it. Uh, but yeah, leave a comment if you think I excluded anything and I don't have the time to respond to all of them. But if there's a you know a good one, I would really love to like pin it so people could see and perhaps develop more or, or provide more than, than I necessarily do here. But yeah, on that note, take care.